Welcome to Secure Insights, the only podcast where you can hear about the latest cybersecurity issues, quick hacks, and trending IAM products directly from the industry's top data security experts. This podcast is divided into two parts. The second part of this podcast will be live on 30th of September. So listeners, don't forget to mark the date. Hello everyone and welcome to today's session. This is Jeannie Jessica and you're listening to Secure Insights, a series of conversation with industry experts, influencers and leaders in the cybersecurity space. So today we have a very special guest with us. He has been on our show before as well. So before starting, I would like to give a brief introduction of him. He is the Chief Strategist and Chief Security Officer at Security Mentor an internationally recognized cybersecurity leader, technologist, keynote speaker, blogger, author, and the list goes on. Please welcome Mr. Dan Lorman. Hi, Dan. We are honored to have you here again. Thank you, Jeannie. It's great to be with you again. Thank you for having me. We are very much looking forward to this conversation, Dan. And I'm quite sure that our audience is also excited to know what you're going to speak today on cybersecurity. Um, so, would you please give us a brief on your topic? Sure. Um, so, today we'd like to discuss um, the importance of building a culture of cybersecurity in your organization, whether that is a government organization or a private sector organization, a business, small size business, large business, the importance of building a culture of cybersecurity. And, um, I'd like to briefly just start with what I mean by that and, and, and kind of define a culture of cybersecurity and, um, you know, really just kind of uh, give an overview. And then I think, you know, Ginny and I are going to have a conversation. She's going to ask me some questions uh, related to the topic specifics that, you know, make it very practical as far as how you can, can implement this in your company, in your business, in your situation. So, um, I think most people understand at a high level the importance of culture. Um, I think it was best set us basically um, talked about or, or really explained a few years ago. I heard a, a really great intro by the CEO of Yum Brands, that's Y-U-M, Yum, uh, who, who was David Novak at the time, who's built several companies, he's built his own company, he's done a lot. And he's really credited with you know, huge success in multiple global international companies all over the world. And uh, one of the things David Novak said was um, you know, really uh, a culture, uh, the culture you have, building a great culture with your set of core, core values is really what set young brands apart, what set all of his companies apart. And really, it's the most important ingredient in any organization. So it's really what are the um, the go-to uh, um, priorities, but but really, how do people act? You know, what are the what are the ways that people interact? Um, what are the core values that they have? Um, they understand the key messages um, related to. Um, you know what what makes your company different uh, and you know david novak uh, which by the way young brands that you know it has the pizza hut taco bell burger king a number of other companies talked about that in a, in a wide sense of you know really um doing things like saying thank you and having great customer service having you know the attitude of employees you know what what do employees say do you know how people talk about having a great workplace wanting to work at certain companies and there's a global demand for staff and and so you know, I think generally speaking, you know, you'll understand what we mean by culture. So then what is a culture of cybersecurity? It's, it's those habits, it's those um, basic um, items that, that any organization has that, like, are they implementing um, a number of different things? And we'll walk through a list of, of some of those in more detail with Jeannie in a few minutes. But uh, the, the, the cyber ethics, you know, the, the values of the employees, Cyber hygiene, you know, looking at how people do day to day, what the technologies they use, people process and technology, you'll hear that a lot. You know, how do they actually implement it? I mean, everyone talks about people, pro people process and technology, but how do they actually implement that? Um, how do they uh, do things in repeatable ways? And so not just doing something once, 
but you know just like you think about um, habits you may have in your your life as far as exercise and dieting and and living a healthy lifestyle to have a healthy culture um, of of uh, of you know cybersecurity is 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 paramount. Um, and I'll just say one other thing, and then we'll, we'll we'll jump to some questions. But you know, why is it so important today? I mean, one of the things we'd say there's a lot of reasons. I could list a, a long number of reasons why this is important. But as we see these um, accelerating number of data breaches, um, that you know, really all over the world with ransomware, Colonial Pipeline, um, Solar Winds, um, supply chain attacks, you know, more and more and more attacks. Um, we're gonna we're gonna walk through how you know many of them and different studies say different things, but many of them could have been avoided had the end user done something differently. Had they um, you know not clicked on a link, had they not reused their passwords, had they changed their password, had they done two-factor authentication, had had they done a you know um, different and and not just you know the random person or you know someone over in the corner doing the right thing it's we're talking about culture of cybersecurity. it's when the organization as a whole say all the employees or certainly most of the employees um hopefully all the employees are are doing the right thing over and over again um every day wherever they're working at home or work and so that's really what we're talking about today a culture of cybersecurity and and how do you build it how do you get it what are the components of it um and I, I really think it's essential. Most uh, leaders, um, security leaders, chief security officers, uh, chief technology officers would say that the culture of cybersecurity is, is perhaps one of the greatest needs that organizations have. And uh, there is no silver bullet for stopping data breaches. There's no silver bullet for stopping ransomware. But as we walk through the list of items over the next uh, 45 minutes, you know, really talking talking about this um, topic, and and I think maybe this could be divided up into two podcasts. So maybe we're going to take this in two two pieces. But um, you know, as you do this more and more, you will um, ultimately um, mitigate your risk, the risks that exist, your cyber risk, the organizational challenges and risks, um, and you will reduce the likelihood of a data breach. And also be able to recover faster should there be a ransomware or data breach. You'll have the kinds of things in place to know how to recover and be really resilient, which is the key word you know used a lot in the United States right now and around the world. Uh, Department of Homeland Security talks about resiliency and being able to bounce back if there is an incident. So all of those things go into building a culture of cybersecurity. So Jeannie, with that, I can hand it back to you, and we can uh, we can have the uh, conversation. Yes, Dan, sure. So Dan, I would like to start this questionnaire round by asking you, what would be your guidelines if an organization does not have a cybersecurity culture and wants to get started with it? Yeah, great, great question. And I, I think, you know, I'd like to walk through, and this will take a, a few minutes, but just kind of walk through, um, and there's a there's a blog link I can also send uh, to Jeannie, um, uh, that I have, I did for Government Technology Magazine. It's also my LinkedIn, um, what I call seven steps for building a culture of uh, cybersecurity. Um, I think the first one is, and we'll dive into some more of these in, in a little bit more detail, um, but I think really it starts with a genuine executive priority and support. So getting that executive buy-in um, and, and really, you know, not just um, uh, just saying that you support cybersecurity, and again, this could be government or you know uh, public sector or private sector. But actually, people watch, and they and they and they you know they watch what you do and not just what you say. I've never seen a leader, by the way, Jeannie, who you know who will uh, say, "Oh, I'm against cybersecurity." That just doesn't happen, right? Um, everyone says they're for it, but but do they really you know put priority behind it? Do they put resources behind it? Budget, staffing. Do the, do the projects really get priority? When there's a, a tough decision, you know, is cybersecurity kept at the top of the list as a priority and really thought about? But you know, starting off with that genuine executive priority and support, and maybe in a little bit we can talk about what, you know, if you don't have that, how do you get it? But that's certainly um, a, a big one. Um, and I also, I, I have, we can, if you want, I can dive into some stories about about that. In fact, I'll, I'll start with, I'll give you one quick story of this now. In the state of Michigan, I worked for Governor Rick Snyder. This was back about uh, eight years ago. 
And uh, he, you know, he was kind of walking the talk. He was governor, who was former CEO of Gateway Computers, and um, and he he basically, um, you know, he really did believe in cybersecurity, made it a priority. And uh, we were rolling out our security awareness training um, across state government, and uh, fifty-five thousand state employees. You know, I was the CSO, and it was a brand new program. We had thrown away our old program, built this new program. And one of the things the governor did at the beginning of a, of a, of a, of a, of a cabinet meeting, which is like a staff meeting of his direct reports, the top department directors, you can think of it as the board of directors for a large corporation. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, he said, and he asked at, at that meeting before the meeting started, it was not even on the agenda. How many of you have taken the security awareness training? And um, no hands went up. And he said, well, I took the training. It was great training. I, I really, really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. And uh, I want each one of you to take the training and I want each one of your direct reports to take the training. And oh, by the way, I'm gonna ask you again next month. Boom, done, 30 seconds. But that came from the top. The next month he asked the same question over again. You know, um, how many of you have taken the training? And all the hands went up, right? Well, we, we knew only about half of them had actually taken the training, but the ones, even the ones that didn't have take the training, um, ran back and told the staff, you know, cancel meetings, we need to get this done and we need our direct reports to do it. So people knew that, um, that you know, he believed in this, he put, we put it in newsletters, we put it in a lot of correspondence, he talked about it all the time. So that exec, that's what I'm talking about, you know, walking the talk, the executive buy-in, doesn't have to be expensive. In, in some cases, it's just literally, you know, um, not executives not saying I'm exempt from from doing the things that all the other employees are expected to do. So those are kind of, you know, how you start. Let me quickly go through the rest of the list and we can maybe dive into some of these in a little bit more detail a little bit later. But um, number one would be an honest, you know, number two, I'm sorry, um, after executive buying would be an honest risk assessment to measure security culture. So where are you at now? What's kind of the as is, we call it in consulting practice, as is analysis. Where are you at? Where are your risks? How are you doing in different parts of the organization, your businesses? You know, really doing that honest risk assessment. The next step after that would be a vision of where you want to be. So kind of that 2B model that, you know, where, what's the model? Where do we want to be, say, over the next two years, over the next three years, um, maybe over the next one year? But really, what are the tactical, um, you know, and strategic uh, initiatives that you have and really kind of laying out that culture. One of the best ways to do that is look at some people that are best in practice around, you know, in your government or in your private sector, you know, who really do it, is doing it well and go visit and get a vision of how they do things. That would be a great example. Uh, number four would be have, having a cyber plan. So it's the, it's the how do you get from where you're at to where you want to be. So it's really building that plan, um, you know, making sure you have a roadmap, knowing where you're going to go, knowing how you're going to get there, both tactical and strategic goals and, and, and really making them measurable goals, um, you know, I think is, is a real important piece of it. Number five is clear communication to the masses. So really, you know, getting the word out once you've got this plan and you know how your know, strategy and how you're going to get where you want to be laying out to people. What is what are, what is a clear plan? What is expected of them? What will you be doing? That includes policies that includes um, really making it clear on um, what the expectations are and what people are going to be doing and clearly articulating. One of the biggest things most employees say is they don't have clear communication from management. So um, that's really huge. Number six would be end user security awareness training for everyone, includes managers, sysadmins, uh, role specific training, um, basically telling people, you know, not just, you know, the policies of course, um, but but really training people and that's everybody. And that certainly you have to be training your technical staff and certifications and they need to be competent and qualified, but you have to, everyone has a role in this. So the, the front lines needs to be your eyes and ears of, of, of everything and, and uh, really understanding um, you know, I, I heard somebody say this, I'm not sure it's a great analogy, but I just popped it in my head, so I'll say it. It's like, how do you find a needle in the haystack? Um, you know, you, you gotta have the whole, each piece of hay in the haystack reporting back that, hey, there's a needle sitting here. You know, if that front line is each piece of that hay, if, if every, everybody in a large organization or small organization is a security um, advocate, then you're gonna have a much more powerful security team. And then lastly, I have celebrate success with food and fun. You know, one of the things Novak says from Yum um, was, you know, how do you celebrate? You know, in one sense, security is never done. You're always getting better, you're always challenging, but it's important to have projects. Um, make, you know, having fun and celebrating success part of your DNA, part of the, the way you do things. So we, we achieve a project, we achieve a goal, 
we have a party, we have, you know, we have food, we have uh, fun, maybe give some awards. Um, recognize people doing things right and saying thank you. So that's also a big part of really, you know, um, having a culture of cybersecurity. So I'll stop there. Those are just some of the things um, that really uh, people can think about when they're starting to have a, a, a building a culture of cybersecurity. Yes, uh, these seven guidelines which you have mentioned right now totally make sense. And people out there who want to start cybersecurity culture in the respective organization now know the seven rules, which can help you kickstart your plan of building this culture. Uh, so, Dan, moving to the next question. Uh, what hurdles does an organization face from an infrastructure point of view when they want to get started with cybersecurity culture? Yeah, so infrastructure, you know, that's obviously a huge issue right now with um, you know, critical infrastructure and what's going on around the world um, with attacks, you know, the Colonial Pipeline, the JBS meets and, and, and those things. Um, it really depends upon, obviously, different organizations have different challenges. Some um, do this very well um, and, and some not so much. But I think one of the biggest challenges that people face is legacy equipment. You know, they may have a, a vision of being innovative. You say, or well, one of our goals is to be an innovative company. I want to do all these cutting edge things. I want to bring in, you know, new technologies. I want to bring in artificial intelligence. I want to bring in, you know, machine learning, or I want to bring in, you know, you know, whatever it might be, whatever business you're in, autonomous vehicles or drones or, you know, whatever. I mean, or, or you know, I want to bring in new um, I want to move to the cloud and not be in the, the, you know, get rid of the data centers that we have or move away from the data centers. But a lot of times organizations struggle because they've got um, a large amount of legacy software and legacy hardware. I can't tell you how many times when I was in government, um, you know, people would, would, would announce new products and new services that would really enhance our, our security architecture. Um, I'm not going to start naming vendors, but um, this happened really with a number of different vendors. And one of the first things we found out was, you know, we needed to have a much higher version. We needed to go from version nine to version 11 or version 12. Um, and, and we were, and we couldn't leave version nine of what we had because some of our, our software wouldn't run in the higher versions. There, there was a, you know, a number of problems with the applications that couldn't run um, for, for various reasons. And so, you know, in some cases, equipment was bought or things were purchased that wouldn't even work because we couldn't upgrade operating systems or, or database versions to higher levels. Um, so that legacy, that legacy equipment, that legacy software, legacy hardware often is a hurdle. Um, and, and, you know, so I think it, it's a challenge and you really have to build a roadmap. I think for a lot of governments, especially, that's a huge challenge of, of, of legacy equipment and, and, and uh, building a plan that, you know, the, going through those steps of the as is, how we, what are we at today, to that to be where we're going to go. There's some, always some low hanging fruit to get some quick wins, but there's always some other items that are going to take years because you really have to move off of some, some pretty critical legacy software and hardware that people need to, to, to really um, get rid of, quite frankly, move on from, and maybe been around for 20 or 30 years but needs to be replaced and, and it's going to take time and money to do it. Uh, Dan, just to tell you, we have a long list of questions for you, which our listeners are eager to know the answers of. But before we dive into those questions, it's time to take a break. So Dan, let's meet again on 30th of September to cover the rest of the questions. And listeners, don't forget to tune in to our podcast on 30th of September, where you will find out all the answers of all the questions which you have been waiting to know from Dan. So till then, goodbye and stay safe.